studies at Brown University, a native of Peru. His work has been translated into most of the modern languages and also into Farsi, Arabic, and Quechua. He's the author of Poetics of Change, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and the Power of Fiction, and Transatlantic Translations. Along with these critical studies, he's published, how do you pronounce this, Ayachuco? Ayachuco Goodbye, a novel and emotions, poems. His stories have appeared in journals including Antias, um, yeah, Antias and Sudden Fiction International. Thank you for coming. Very glad to be here. And I, I spent six years as a professor at UT, and my son and my daughter live here, so it's very close to me, Austin. And this morning I went to the Driscoll to have breakfast <laughs> in honor of Borges. I met him there, the <laughs> Driscoll's in 82. <laughs> and uh, after that, I went to the uh, Ransom Center to see Gabriel Garcia Marquez's papers. Just arrived to UD, another friend. Uh, I met him uh, many years ago. And I remember once uh, I asked Borges, do you know about 100 years of solitude, famous novel? And he told me, no. They told me that it takes 100 years to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and I told Garcia Marquez that, a mistake of mine. <laughs> said, you know that, uh, Gabo, you know that Borges told me this? And he didn't laugh. <laughs> so, in honor of those two guys, <laughs> I, I uh, will talk a little about my story. <clears throat> Basically, <clears throat> this story is uh, an answer to the question, what to do with a dream. Uh, Maria Kodama, uh, Borges' widow, told me that Borges used to dream all his stories, most of his stories, and he wake up and said, I dreamt a new story. And he just went to write down that like, uh, somebody was dictating the story, almost without revision. He remembered everything from the story that he learned. So he was working. He was blind, of course. And I don't know if that's an advantage for short stories, <laughs> but uh, he was able to, to do that. Uh, Julio Cortázar, also was uh, as close also to us here in Austin. Uh, when I was a professor, I was instrumental in purchasing his archives, those uh, splendid collection of papers, personal papers are in the Benson Library. And he, the same like Borges, was able to dream his own story, <coughs> even novel. Uh, for instance, once he had this dream, uh, he saw a couple that was leaving his home, his house, and closing the door forever. That was all the, the dream. And he wrote Casa Tomada, House Taking Over, which is exactly that situation. Uh, Borges read that story, and he liked it too much that he published it for the first time in a journal in Buenos Aires. Uh, he also read the uh, beginning of Hotspot, Rayuela in Spanish, his famous novel. Uh, in his dream, he was in his flat in Paris, but looking at the window, he saw one street in Buenos Aires. And this overlapping of spaces it's a typical dream of an exile writer because uh, the spaces are articulated some way or the other in the dream. No? So uh, those uh, magnificent lessons of uh, dreaming uh, made me think that uh, the dream I had, very modest dream, uh, was, uh, it was possible to write down and tell you this story about the dream. Uh, my conclusion is that uh, there are 
no novels about happy dreams, happy families, what they say, but unhappy dreams are the stuff of hybrid fiction. Uh, with that optimistic uh, declaration, I leave you to read perhaps the first section, which is too long, uh, melodrama, the dream. Do you think it's not very long? No, it's too long. <laughs> I you decide. <laughs> okay. Long dream. <laughs> Guys, tell me when you've heard enough, okay? I never stop. <laughs> it becomes a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The dream. <clears throat> the deranged girl being brought into the plaza to confess her sin is you. I recognize you despite her pallor and the prisoner's uniform she wears because you stare straight ahead with the same genteel lucidity. But who, I ask myself, not understanding my place in that audience, is dragging this girl here to be made an example of? She has the open look of truth, but if you reveal me to these people, I will have to flee. I want to embrace her if only to convince myself that I am not the proof of disaffection. I am a witness of this woman, an unknown part of me. Perhaps I am the part of reason that she still awaits. Now I look for your eyes and say it. You are myself without me. This is the enigma of my dream. The verb enunciates her. The pronoun reiterates me, but language excludes us from being able to define each other. She, I insist, is what I am not in myself. In her, I am someone who eludes me. Surrounded by triumphant doctors and lawyers, she steps onto the platform to confess her guilt. The mob looks for stones, but there are none and their anachronism is as crude as their resentment. They demand that the wound be opened in public so that the patient will purge her own misery. I, her secret lover, am here to recognize her, but I can do nothing but follow the events that rush with clinical logic. With her long hair and torn clothing, she seeks with her eyes and looks at me with pain and does not understand my silence. You gotta keep going. <laughs> the tale. How can I say I am calling you after all these years to tell you a dream? It would be better to ask if she had dreamed about us as well. At least she would laugh and say, you are trying to share the luxury of guilt. But let me light a cigarette. You wake me up at this hour instead of remembering my birthday and sending me flowers, or at least an Italian opera. But I am not calling her. I would not know how to tell her a dream in which she appears like some soft Freudian madwoman, and I, her lover, as the witness of her high, tumultuous bed. The Confession. We finish the way couples finish, divided between guilt and laughter. Then she married. As in an American novel, we get along again. She demanded the stars from me. The stars, wait, let me see them. And we play to extinguish them with our hands. The sequel. She finally enters the defendant's box with the integrity of her youth, impelled by the impatience of the judge <coughs> and the rush of the mad crowd. She looks at all of us, resigned to her clinical death, and says, love would save me, even if it is too late. I expect the huge spotlights of yet another chapter of the national melodrama about the couple without a future, but from her sentence, I, under I only understand my name. Should I leave, or should I overwhelm the enemy and rescue her? How might I interpret the ceremony Dream, sofa story, operatic chapter. Take her by the hand and escape. 
When irony comes to save me, I resist it. I prefer the twist of remorse. But emotion hampers us and makes us awkward. One should allow the tears to speak, so to speak. The dialogue. After all, perhaps you went with me and then left me forever. We are that slight disagreement. Every time we meet, every time we met you, every time we met, you would pass me a slip of paper with your telephone number on it, remember? First your parents answered, then your husband, and not long ago, your daughter. This time, I myself answered. She is not here, I said. She has left. The goodbyes. Why don't you leave me in peace? I'm not asking you for anything. What more do you want? One day you wrote to me and I answered immediately. Then you turned your back and went to sleep. There you have it, another star. Thank you, Thank you guys. <laughs>